Right, I'm going to start this little update on grass-free lawns. Four things, staring at a grass lawn. Um, just for a sort of quick comparison here, here's the, the lawn right beside the experimental plot where I've been growing my grass-free lawns. I'm just having a quick look. Um, you see that there are about three or four species of grasses. And if we look down here, you can see some yarrow, um, there's some stellaria, uh, some ranunculus. Um, oh, over there we've got some uh, trifolium repens. And just looking around to see what else there is. Um, yeah, not a, a lot. Really? Uh, so, uh, this particular lawn, here we are at sort of the uh, beginning of October, and this particular lawn hasn't been treated in any way for about 20 years, it's just been cut, um, and the cutting is left on the surface. And as you can see, oh, is that a bit of a plantain over there? No, some sorrel. Um, oh, and a dandelion. Here we have a dandelion as well. So, in terms of sort of species diversity, it's not exactly rich, so let's have a look at a grass-free lawn. Now this one was planted at um, autumn 2011, and here we are in autumn 2013, so it's been through, through two uh, winters. One was supposed to be the worst British winter in 100 years. Um, and here we have a grass-free lawn, and let's just have a quick look through some of the species and see what we can find. Um, right. Ah, a bit of Mazus reptans, some Renunculus repen, uh, Ajuga reptans, the ornamental version there, uh, Bellis perennis we've got here, um, Potentilla reptans we've got down here, um, this is uh, Yarrow, Achelia millifolium, and growing with it, a very similar leaf anyway, is a, an erodium. I can't quite remember the name of this erodium, but it's an erodium, that I'm sure. Um, and we've got the lawn. Oh, yes, uh, we've got the lawn chamomile. I do like that. That smells lovely. Um, the lawn chamomile here. Um, if we go in a little bit closer, we can see some of this is what the Cana inermis purpurea, um, which is doing okay. Uh, this is Viola odorata, sweet violet. We've got, looking down here, this is uh, Lobelia pedunculata. I'm not sure whether it's... No, that would be the, the pale blue flowered one. Um, we've got Germander speedwell, uh, Veronica comhedris here. We've got mint, I think this one is Thymus sapillum. Um, oh, these little blue flowers, yeah, that's definitely going to be the Alabelia pedunculata. Um, moving about just a little bit, here we've got some self heal, Prunella reptans. It's got a season change, it's giving me the snuffles. Um, uh, silverweed. Um, that's Argentina Anserina, it used to be Potentilla Anserina, recently got changed to that name. Um, what else have we got? A uh, little flower down there, there's not much flower on the lawn at this time of year. But this is Phylonodiflora, uh, one of the, uh, the plants you wouldn't expect really to survive. Um, but it's been here for two years and that comes from sort of Florida, southeastern the United States. Um, so you wouldn't really expect tropical plants to do particularly well, but that's, that's managed okay here. Um, tucked away behind it, what's this? We've got, I think that's Placella aurantiaca, um, fox and cubs, that's known by. Um, this is the blue pea, uh, Parachetus communis. Um, what have we got over here? Oh, it's one of those, uh, one of the ornamental clovers, and another ornamental clover here. They're all trifolium repens, I think this one comes from dragon's blood, must be a, a baby of dragon blood, and that's probably a baby of William, uh, which is where I originally started sort of from my breeding um, stuff here. Um, just moving along, a couple of other bits and pieces down here, although it's actually on the edge, it's useful to show you this here on the edge because we've got some flowers and you can see some of these lovely 
red berries. This is um, uh, Lobelia angulata. Uh, they used to be, all these Lobelias used to be called Pratias and still labelled Pratias in some of the garden centres. That's a New Zealand native, that one. Um, and the New Zealand natives seem to do quite well here. Well, the ones that I've used have anyway. Um, let's move over a bit. Let's see if there's anything else immediately springing to mind. Oh, another one of the adjugas. Uh, I think that one's um, Atro purpurea. Uh, the other one was Burgundy Glow. Um, what's that? That's a piece of silverweed. Um, dum, 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 dum. Oh, here we are. Uh, this is uh, Linaria repens. It's a British native. It's in decline across the UK, I think, that one. It doesn't often get to flower in here. It just doesn't seem to be strong enough. Um, although it spreads by rhizomes, so it hasn't died out. Oh, you can just see we've got a bit of a flower down here. Well, we had a bit of a flower. I've just knocked it off. That's um, Polygala vulgaris. Another British native, actually, that's probably in, in a bit of decline, um, as I recall. And then we've got Lotus caniculata, so birds for trefoil. Um, oh, there's a, there's a flower over there. Oh, I'm on the way towards the flower. Um, it's a bit crunched down, but we've got uh, Primula veris. Yeah, we've got. And. Um, the flower I was just heading over towards here. This one you can just about see. That's an oxalis. I've got a couple of oxalis in the lawn. Uh, this one's the autumn flowering one, uh, oxalis lobata. But I do have oxalis uh, diepii, sometimes um, called inops, in here as well. But that finished flowering a couple of weeks back. And as you can see, we have wildlife, that's for sure. Looks like foxes have been around. Got me a piece of a fox poo there. I'm sure there'll be more of it about. You get wildlife on this lawn. The wood pigeons come and chomp away at some of these ornamental clovers. They do seem to like the red leaf ones. I haven't been on here for a while, so you can see some of the red leaves are still here. But um, talking of red leaves, there's something completely not a red leaf over there. Worth worth noting. Um, this is uh, Trifolium pretensi, Susan Smith. You can probably see the yellow veins on that one. Um, oh, red flowers on the red clover. Then we've got a bit of glaucoma hederacea, this one's variegata. Um, and you can also see uh, this one's a leptinella. I think this one it's squalida, probably plants black. I do have just a well maybe not, maybe there's just squalida. There is plants black in here as well. Oh another little thing down here, this one's mottled leaf. Eurasium maculatum, I think that one's leopard. Um, and ooh, we've got some more time stuck over here. Let's sort of see the time is going through this. I was told by somebody very, very um, knowledgeable of times, shall we say, um, that it wouldn't survive in this kind of environment. It wouldn't stand being mown, it wouldn't stand being walked on, it wouldn't stand being in competition with other plants. Um, I'm rather delighted to find that that's not entirely the case. We can see one of the things that has surprised me actually um, is there are seedlings. So things that's probably going to be bellus. There's plenty of bellus about. This time last year, there was loads of bellus everywhere, and the year before. But this year, this time of year, nothing, nothing much to speak of really. It seems things seem to go in cycles. The buttercups did that a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, there's quite a lot of um, uh, the blue pea. Um, it's probably going to flower in the next six weeks or so. Um, there's usually quite a sort of rush of foliage of a plant that's going to come into flower, and this is rushing. And it did a real good display two years ago in November. Ah, here we have a cochula. Um, and oh, anything else exciting worth seeing? But I'm hoping, sort of, as I just sort of wander around on this slightly moist lawn, you're going to see. Um, how densely this has been put together. You can sort of see that uh, in terms of depth it goes about to my to my um, 
well, that knuckle anyway. Um, and that seems to be about a good height to keep things at, about four to six centimetres seems to be the ideal thing. Um, and some more sweet violets over here. Oh, here's one of my favourite clovers, if not my favourite clover, in fact. This one. I really do like the red on this. It's a lovely thing, even though it's not in flower, the leaves are really contributing to this. I like it a little bit more than the, uh, the darker purple form over there. Personal preferences, I suppose. Um, anything else we have worth highlighting? Um, yeah. I just found another fox dropping. Uh, and that's me wiping my hand on the lawn. Um, uh, da, 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 da. See, all of these things have managed to come together in a really nice and richly thick sward. Oh, there's a, that's a Juga genivensis um, down there. So one of the other Ajugas, that's done okay. Um, is there anything else? Uh, oh, there we go. Oh, in case you didn't know what fox and cubs is, there's one in flower there. Not the orange hawkweed. Um, I threw some seeds in of some cyclamen one or two years ago when we started. Cyclamen coom, and it's now big enough to show that you threw some leaves. It's got cyclamen leaves coming through. They might even flower. Yeah, you had a bit of a battery problem then. Um, so I've had to reach out to the battery and pop back. So I think I was over here having a chat, um, and I was having a look at. Um, these cyclamen that have turned up in the lawn. They turned up, I sowed them, say, a couple, a couple of years ago with some seeds, but they're now certainly big enough for the, the leaves to have shown through, which is a really nice thing to see. Another species hidden away over here is a Stellaria graminea. Um, I think I've already pointed out the Veronica camahedris short-term memory lapse, I think, uh, to go home and recharge the battery. Uh, yeah, we've got some Ajuga uh, reptans, uh, Atropurpurea. Ooh, here we go. Just see this one little leaf here, that's Geranium tibeticum, um, which sort of spreads by sort of rhizomes and nodules through the soil. Um, that looked quite pretty when it was in flower. I'm pleased to see it's still around. I'd Still unsure as to whether it's going to survive for a very long period, but um, it's certainly in here now um, and and staying with me. Um, there's another geranium that I used. I did actually start off with geranium pyrenaicum, um, but I found the pyrenaicum it grows a, it's just a little bit too big. The leaves are too tall and, and too big and, and too full of chlorophyll. It makes it quite vigorous. Um, it really needs to be kept in check. Um, things that I certainly didn't sow. I've got, got a little melliot in there. Um, and down here we've got some Frankenia thymifolia. Um, and some more of the Linaria reptans. And some Frankenia hidden in with it. Uh, more of the, uh, oops, the uh, Linaria. Anything else over here? Yes, there was another geranium I used. Um, um, and one that seems to work out quite well. Oh, there's a flower of it over there. Um, and it's this one, which is quite low, um, and tends to grow reasonably prostrate, actually, after it's been hit by the mower a couple of times, anyway. And we've got this kind of little flower here. This is from Japan. It's um, Geranium Yoshinoi. Um, I must feel I should pronounce that in a Japanese way. I've lived there for a number of years. I'd probably do it right. But Yoshinoi will do. <laughs> um, there is some. Uh, ah, here we have uh, well, the remains of a flower. It's just a, the remains. They're normally quite, quite big. But this is um, Huopsis stylosa. It's a European plant rather than a British native. 
Um, and and that just it's it's an adventitious roots plant, and it will not go. Uh, doesn't seem really seem to matter what you do to this one. Uh, chop it away, and it and it comes back. It's a little bit tatty, I have to say. Uh, you know, when it gets chopped, it doesn't really like it, and it does leave these these um, sort of straw-like stems. But um, it does okay, and ground cover is is very very useful. Uh, is there something a little off screen has got my attention? Oh, cleavers. <laughs> oh, no, it's not cleavers, that's the Cropsis stylosa again. Oh, and there's the flower head, and it's probably got some seeds on there as well. It looked and felt like cleavers for a moment. Is there anything else while I'm over here um, that I haven't already kind of found? Oh, yes, uh, down here. Um, not looking a bit tatty, but. That is definitely some, yes, wild marjoram. Um, I say wild, that's a cultivated form. Um, and growing beside it, or with it here, we've got a dianthus. Um, yeah, that's actually all over here, the dianthus. So, and that's, a, I'm a pleased to see that. And that actually does manage to do a bit of flowering, uh, although it's not the kind of flowering that you would expect if you put it in a pot. I mean, separating any plant out and giving it its own space and giving it special treatment does produce different kinds of results. Um, what else? Anything exciting? Oh, there's lots more thyme over here. There's a thyme all the way through here. Oh, mixed in well with the reptinellas as well. Um, again, I'm really rather chuffed at it. Time seems to do fine in here. I only took a put, put about three blocks in when I started. Yeah, it's nice to know it's here years later. Uh, you can still see uh, some of the red um, berries of the uh, Lobelia angulata, was Pratia angulata. Um, yes, so really that's. Um, about it. I've taken you for a bit of a wander over this grass-free lawn and hopefully you will have noticed that it is indeed grass-free. You do get the occasional bit. I think it's impossible to keep anything out if it really wants to be in here. Um, but here we have uh, well, what will be um, four years worth of work. All come together. It's going to be odd finishing all of this. I've I never quite devoted myself to a horticultural project for four years in this way. Um, and yes, it's going to be unusual to have completed all this. I just hope people like it and, and, and want to put it in their lawns. Um, the biodiversity, we just did a pollinator study. Um, and pollinators, compared to what they do in normal lawns or even the seed sown flower lawns that you can buy at the moment, it's just phenomenally different. Enormous amounts of pollinating events and different types of pollinators use this and visit this type of lawn. Um, I did an infiltration experiment looking at water infiltration in it as well. Just to sort of see, somebody asked me um, while I was down in Avondale Park. And um, surprise, actually, because I had no idea, uh, this, uh, the diversity of the root structures through the soil seem to allow water infiltration at least twice as good as you would expect on a mature grass lawn. I mean, the lawn I started with uh, showing with you, I, I use that as a comparison. And the thatch that builds up in a lawn uh, that isn't dethatched anyway, um, certainly acts as a thatch. Um, and uh, it must do in some way or form because the soil was quite dry underneath it. And when we were doing the uh, infiltration tests, um, the single sort of just grassy roots didn't really help anything at all, um, which was a you know, pleasant result. It's nice to know that uh, this thing can drink water, but then I've never seen it flooded and uh, in some heavy rain events, some of the soil around here does get quite sodden. This is seasonally waterlogged um, silty loam, I think it's called Hurst 841B, uh, if you go to the soil people. Um, 
so we get more flowers, greater biodiversity, greater plant diversity, uh, greater pollinator diversity, greater water infiltration. Uh, all in all, I'm going to highly recommend this and say this has been a successful conclusion to the research. I uh, hope you found this useful and interesting.